Hi everyone, uh, welcome back to my YouTube channel and today I'm just going to be telling you a little bit about how to prepare or how to clean ammonites. Uh, you might or might not be able to see that one, there's one hidden in there. This is a piece of a nodule that's come out of uh, the cliffs at Black Ven in Lyme Regis. Um, I got out of this nodule quite a sizable bag of pieces which all have ammonites in them and today I'm just going to, well hopefully, show you how to clean them. I've come down to do this, I've come down to a place called the Fossil Workshop in Lyme Regis uh, where two friends of mine, Paddy and Chris, uh, work when they're not out taking the fossil tours with the museum and I'm borrowing their equipment today. So next door in the room behind me over there is uh, a compressor, a large sort of compressor on top of a big tank and that compresses the air to I think it's somewhere in the region of uh, about 70 p is it bar or? 70 psi, so pounds per square inch. Uh, I don't know what that is in bars, but um, and we're going to be using this. This is something called a, a pneumatic chisel or an air pen. And what it is, it's essentially it's an engraver, uh, a metal engraver by Chicago Pneumatics, which has been retrofitted. It's had a load of the parts taken out of it and replaced with uh, tungsten uh, carbide or uh, tungsten steel, stronger replacement parts, so a lot of the springs, the uh, point for example is tungsten carbide and the advantage of using this over something like a, a hammer and chisel is that when this point moves back and forwards it only moves about the thickness of my fingernail so whenever you're using it you always know exactly where that point's going to be and you don't have to concentrate so much on what the rest of the, on what your other hand is doing. With a hammer and chisel however you're concentrating half of your attention on where you're hitting so you're not hit, you don't hit your hand uh, which means that you can't control so much where the point of the chisel is going so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start cleaning I'm going to move the camera then I'm going to start cleaning this guy and hopefully you'll get some idea of what I'm doing and I'll stop as I'm going on and explain exactly what's going on okay so I've moved the camera and now you can see where I'm going to be working this is a sandbag uh, which allows you just to hold the item in any position that you need to. And you can see the ammonite curling around here. It's been partially exposed on this side which is helpful because that means we can just follow that around. Um, and what we're doing is we're going to be exploiting a line of weakness which is actually between the inside of the shell of the animal and the calcite and mud that fills it. So if I take this piece uh, you might be able to see this is the actual shell of the animal here and that there is uh, the calcite that's filled this and you can see where it's popped as we call it, it's popped off of the calcite here but it hasn't done here. With any luck these ammonites will pop entirely in there all the way around and we'll end up with something looking a bit like this. This is one that uh, Paddy and Chris have been cleaning for somebody. Um, and uh, I should mention that I am wearing a safety mask and a pair of uh, safety goggles because bits of this rock will likely fly off in all directions and the dust can actually give you severe uh, problems later in life, such as bron bronchitis and other such diseases. So what I'm going to do, put my mask on, and we're going to start by going around, following this edge, and trying to clean away all the way around so that we're left with a pedestal of rock in the middle, which hopefully, with any luck, will come out very easily. So, here goes nothing. And don't worry, I will fast forward this as we go. Okay, so um, I've muted uh, the sound of the pen out here and I'll do that throughout the rest of the video just because it's quite an annoying noise and I don't think you need to hear it. Okay, so I've made a bit of a cock up there, uh, as you may or may not be able to see, uh, depending on the contrast of this camera. There's a little white mark there, uh, that's where I've uh, pushed a little bit too hard and gone through the shell and into the actual fill of the ammonite, into the, uh, in this case, into the mudstone. But hopefully that will disappear when we get around to the last stage of this process, but just thought I'd point that out. We're very nearly at that stage I was talking about with the pedestal, so I will uh, just get rid of this last bit and we'll see if we can uh, get rid of the rest of the, uh, rest of the rock. Ah. 
Okay. So now we've got to a stage where we have gone all the way around the ammonite. Um, and what we've got to do now is try and get rid of this central uh, piece of rock here, this sort of pedestal in the middle. And uh, this might work or it might not. What I'm going to try and do is try and get it to pop off like this one has off of a different ammonite. And the idea is that uh, if I push down sufficiently hard, right slap bang in the middle of there, uh, it'll vibrate this pedestal, which will cause the calcite of the shell to break, and it'll ping off. Hopefully not directly at the camera lens, but we'll see what happens. Um, and when that's done, I'll show you what we do next. Okay, so it doesn't want to know. It doesn't want to do that, so what I'm going to have to do is continue tracing this round, tracing round from the opening of the shell all the way down into the middle. Now this does mean that there's more risk of me putting more of those white dink marks into this, into the ammonite, but with any luck, it won't be so bad. Uh, this might take me a while though, so I'll definitely be fast forwarding this bit. Okay, so that's the vast majority of the rock gone now, and if I wet that, which does mean spitting on it in this instance, you'll be able to see we've got a lot of the colour still left. Uh, you'll also see that there are quite a few little uh, white dink marks in there, and you'll also, you should be able to make out, a white spiral between the worlds of the ammonite. Now what that is, as I mentioned earlier, what we're doing is exploiting a line of weakness between the fill inside the ammonite and the calcite that uh, makes up the animal shell. So we're trying to ping off that shell. But what happens is where the shell goes between each world of the ammonite, so between this world and this world for example, um, you have to break that shell and it leaves this trail of broken edge all the way down to the middle. Um, now what I'm going to do with that <clears throat> is I'm going to try and clean away as much of that broken edge as possible. But you can't get rid of it. So what we'll do in a minute, once I've gone round and cleared off the very last little scratches of rock that are remaining in here, is I'll use um, a diluted uh, artist varnish, I think it's an acrylic varnish from uh, this particular one in here is De La Roni varnish, and what that does, you just put a layer of that on and then immediately dab as much of it off as you possibly can, and the idea being that um, all that does, it recolours that white and it, this includes any, uh, any of those dink marks that you make, so it uh, it recolours that to the same colour as the rest of the uh, ammonite because what it does, it makes it wet so that it sort of takes on the colour of whatever's behind it in this case, hopefully the rest of the ammonite. So, <clears throat> I'll see you in a minute when that's done. Okay, so that's that bit done. Now, <clears throat> here's the varnish. This is what Paddy and Chris have been using. So this is what I'll be using as well. That's what's here. So what we do is get a very small amount of it, as small as quantity as you possibly can on a paintbrush. Go round inside that shell. Just cover it all up. This does also help because it shows you where you've missed as well. Which means I might be going back in there once it's dried to uh, just clear off some last little bits. And then before it dries completely, what you do, you get some tissue paper and you just dab as much of it off as possible. Now, we're not finished with this ammonite. I've still got to go around the edges <coughs> and uh, sort of get in as far into the ammonite as possible so that as much of it is exposed because it's prettier. The more you expose, the better it tends to be. But there we go. That's what that looks like now. Um, <clears throat> I don't seem to have missed a great deal. There's a little bit of shell still on this edge here, which I need to get rid of. 
uh, and uh, obviously as I said I've got to go round the outside so I'm going to do that now uh, I probably I don't know we'll see we'll see how the video ends up but I might fast forward this bit or I might just let it play through So while, uh, while we're just finishing off there, one thing I will say, you may have noticed that there's a two-tone coloration to this ammonite. You'll see that the sort of uh, the first quarter coil, or quarter whirl, is a dark black colour, that's mudstone, and the rest of the ammonite is a sort of yellowish colour, that's calcite. Now there's a very specific reason why this happens. When the ammonite dies, uh, its outer, outer whirl, the sort of outer half coil, is where the animal lives, and behind that, all of those internal worlds are made up of a series of gas and water chambers that allow the animal to control its buoyancy. When the animal dies, it falls to the seafloor, its soft parts rot away, and then the outer world fills with mud. But the chamber walls that, prov that uh, define each chamber beyond, behind the body chamber prevent that mud getting any further into the shell. And so what happens is... Uh, the animal dies, falls to the seafloor, the outer half coil fills with mud, but can't get any further. What happens after that? If your ammonite is lucky, as this one's been, and is preserved inside a nodule, water percolates through it over time, over millions of years, and deposits the calcium carbonate, or the calcite, inside uh, those chambers, which leaves you with these beautiful calcified uh, centres to the ammonites. If you're unlucky, you won't get that at all, and you'll end up with pressure eventually squashing those chambers. And if you go to the uh, west side of Lyme, you can see a whole bed called the Ammonite Graveyard, where you can see this occurring in almost every Ammonite you see. Uh, it's, not, it's not always calcite, though. You can sometimes find uh, small purpley black crystals of sphalerite, or occasionally other minerals as well. Okay, so this is the end. Well, not quite, but so all I've got to do is go back to that varnish job. Uh, just put a bit more varnish on on the bits that I've redone and the bits that I hadn't exposed beforehand. So just go around there and all the way. This is the bit where you have to be careful because if you put it on the rock, it doesn't look very nice. It looks, frankly, god awful. <coughs> Now, something to say when you, uh, if you ever go into a fossil shop and you're looking at buying something like this, particularly the ones in Lyme Regis, these crystal ammonites, there are some, several things you should look out for. First of all, the varnish. If, and as far as I'm aware, all the fossil uh, shops have varnished ammonites, like as you can see here. But <clears throat> what you want to look at is how shiny they are because they can look a bit tacky. If I was to leave that varnish on and uh, not dab it off with a piece of kitchen towel, then what I would end up with is a very tacky looking ammonite. Almost like it had been made from resin or something. So we're going to make sure that doesn't happen by dabbing it off as quickly as possible. It's a little too shiny for my liking. I might have left that a little too long. In which case I might have to dig out the, uh, uh, the solvent acetone which is used in the varnish and just dab a bit of that on to take some of that varnish away. Um, but two things to look for, A is that varnish, if it's too shiny it's probably overly done. And secondly, this is a, a rock called Yellowstone, this is one of the nodule beds and it's the Yellowstone nodule bed and the ammonites in this tend to be very sticky which is why I've made a bit of a bit of a hash of this one. There are a lot more dink marks in the very middle there than I would personally like. Um, but have a look at the middle of the ammonite. Don't look at the outside. The outer coil is almost always very easy to clean. But if you look at the inner whorls, so that's the very middle, and it looks like it's melted, so you can't see any of the ribs or any of the structure of the ammonite, then that's not a very good ammonite. What someone's done is what I've done here and made a complete hash of it. If you can see all of the structure in there, so all of the ribs going from the middle outwards, then it's worked well. Quick venue change. Okay, so my camera ran out of uh, SD card memory just as I finished recording preparing the ammonite. So uh, thankfully I'll get everything I needed. Um, I was, what I was going to do was uh, time myself doing another ammonite, but I didn't get a chance to do that. Maybe that's a challenge I'll uh, complete another time. 
anyway, if you like this video, please feel free to uh, subscribe or follow me on Twitter or uh, I also have a blog if you're particularly interested. I do do a weekly vlog though, so if you don't like vloggers, you might want to ignore that. Uh, anyway, hopefully you enjoyed that. Thanks very much to the guys at the Fossil Workshop who, when they eventually get a website, I will put it in the description. Uh, they haven't got one yet. Um, if you're ever in Lyme Regis and you want anything identified or you find anything on the beach, you don't know what it is, go and see them free of charge. They don't charge for any identifications and they, they, they do like to talk, especially Chris. He'll talk until the cows come home. Anyway, that's all from me today. So I hope you enjoyed it. Have a good one.